Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. I'm Arthur Hiller, and I'm Chief Business Officer at Neuritas and coming to you from downtown Boston. I'd like to welcome you and start by thanking MassBio and the Drug Discovery Working Group at MassBio for hosting our discussion today. We have a great program planned over the next 60 minutes to discuss the evolving role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in peptide drug discovery. For those of you not familiar with Neurotas, Neurotas is an artificial intelligence enabled peptide focused drug discovery company that was founded in 2014 and has wet lab and data science capabilities that are co-located in offices in downtown Dublin. First of all, a couple of housekeeping notes for our discussion today. Questions from you, our audience, are going to increase the interest of this session for everyone. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat section, uh, the Q&A section, rather. Um, you can post them uh, anonymously, or you can post them so that uh, we announce your name before we address the question. And we'll address them in the panel discussion. We have three brief presentations to get us started, and then we'll come together for a moderated panel where the presenters will be joined by David Friedman, a freelance journalist and writer for Scientific American and Nature, and by Karen Taylor, who's research director of Deloitte UK's Center for Health Solutions since 2011 and who joins us from the UK. David and Karen have separately published compelling data summarizing their research on the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning on drug discovery and their findings will help us kick off our panel discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Ved Srivastava, who's VP of Chemistry at Intarsia Pharmaceuticals and president of the American Peptide Society. Ved? Yeah, thanks, you. thanks uh, Arthur, and thanks MassBio for setting up this meeting. And um, what, what, what I'd like to is share with you, which direction we're going into, uh, actually how far we came from peptide therapeutics and where we're going into. So if you look at that in the last four decades, the peptide therapeutic progress has been skyrocketing uh, in every decade by decade. And, and this is just because of the safety and efficacy of these molecules. But if you look at that uh, recent days, uh, in uh, the number of peptides is going into clinic is, is a huge. And uh, in early uh, 80s, the, the peptide size used to be about 10 amino acid in length, a majority that came in the market. But now uh, peptides are different size and different shape, uh, linear, cyclic, conjugated, more complex. Uh, there are 30 amino acid, 40 amino acid, 50 amino acid, and this is because of the advances that happen in pharmaceutical uh, methods and manufacturing technology. So if you look at that, the Y peptide is not because of the NVKC, it's also because of that is a reduced attrition rate with the peptides. Out of the 100 drugs that goes into the clinic, almost 32% biologics, which is about 25% peptides included in them, they make it to the market. Whereas only 13 uh, molecule, the small molecule make it to the market. Now, if you look at that, uh, the right side of the chart, there are approximately 70 plus molecules out in the market for approved drug for different disease indication. And 150 uh, uh, peptide molecules are currently in the different phases of clinical trial and a handful of those on a pre-registration. So if you look at the success rate that we see here, 25% or this number of uh, uh, drugs that are in the pipeline, you can see a large number of peptide therapeutic will be coming on market over time. And in terms of the, uh, the revenue, uh, there was a, a read an article someplace that the next five year, the peptide therapeutic will be more than $25 million, billion dollar market. That does include some manufacturing of the APIs, including the peptide as well. So if you do the pe uh, uh, search uh, using peptide uh, keyword in the pharmaceutical database, not the Google, 
you're going to see roughly 1500 plus peptide product currently being being studied for wide varieties of different uh, therapeutic area oncology metabolic disease skin disorder all the way to muscle muscle metabolism and but the commercial success that we have seen in the last for several years, so one decade or so is metabolic disease area. They're making billion dollar product. But in the research side, most of the advances that you see is in oncology area. And roughly thousand plus companies are working with peptide, different molecule type means peptidomimetic, microcyclic, peptide conjugate, and not only just a parental dose delivery, but alternative dose delivery as well. For example, buccal, muscle, uh, buccal delivery, inhaled delivery, oral delivery, uh, 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 transplant uh, delivery, implant. So there's so many other different uh, uh, form of these delivery uh, advances happening. In early uh, uh, mid uh, uh, 2000 range, when we didn't have very good artificial intelligence uh, uh, technology was developed, uh, this is back in uh, my Amlin company, in my earlier company that we used to work. We used to build a peptide hormone library in silico, uh, but actually three different approaches. We, we call it hormone, polypeptide hormone library. Uh, and that is three different approaches. One is a literature and patent for which the peptides are known, but their uh, 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 therapeutic potential was not very well explored. So we were looking on those. Then we were looking at second is bioinformatics approach where we take the human genome class programs, different genome of the different species and humans as well. And we apply our internal proprietary algorithm called facts, fiction, and finder. These are our proprietary terminology. And we identify a number of peptides there as well. Then we look at that smart sampling. It's nothing but a find and grind. We take the tissue from the disease area in a normal state and try to grind and isolate the peptide, same thing from the blood and trying to uh, identify using a mass spectrum approach. And then once we identify this peptide, try to work with the bioinformatics and see how these peptides correlate with the database that already exists. So if you look at it, we make more than 1,000 peptide library collection of these. And if you look, the composition was mostly known peptides, mammalian peptide. We had, key thing was pro-hormone remnant that nobody talks about it in those days and alternative process peptide, large protein, and a lot of bioinformatics derived. So these are the used to be composition of the peptides that we used to have. So once you have this peptide, we used to screen them in different cell lines, uh, uh, different part of the body, and trying to find out the receptor. But the key thing that you see lately for the last several years that once is happening in engineering a bioactive molecule into drug-like molecule. And if you look at that, there's a three key elements. One is a correct target selection with the validation, and also peptide optimization where a lot of focus is happening now, the state of our medicinal chemistry to improve the stability of the peptide and, and potency of the peptide, and most importantly, have a very good PK property related to that for longer duration of action. The other area that is very critical is the delivery system selection. You have sustained delivery, long acting implantable or injectable, and then external miniature device. Those days when you have a twice a day injection or once an injection, it's really gone. Now people are looking once in a week and a patient friendly delivery. So this is the area that is booming and is being to be done. These are three, three key challenges that uh, currently will be focused. To, to last slide, uh, just to give you a future direction in therapeutically is in my opinion, the three area. One is the exploring protein protein interaction with peptides but, uh, uh, and then other advancing artificial intelligence. And in terms of delivery, there's a lot of focus happening in oral peptide delivery. So if you look at that here, uh, this is a, a, a intracellular target that has not been explored by peptides. Roughly 80% targets are already there that we need to explore. And once we understand this, this is really a gold mine for, for a therapeutic uh, uh, venue. So these are microcyclic peptides that basically that are, have a capability or uh, features that get inside, inside the cell and bind it specifically in form of geology collection and get out of the cell. And once we do this, understand these things, that we have intracellular targets, cytoplasmic targets, nuclear, nuclear targets, mitochondrial target, we have a lot of things that we can explore. This, this is the area that I see is moving forward, most macrocyclic peptide and staple peptides. The other area where artificial intelligence can help a lot 
and it's, it's growing as called, called personalized peptide vaccine. I'm not talking about COVID, it's just personalized vaccine, where you take the tumor of the healthy uh, uh, patient from the patient, and then also take the tissue from healthy patient. And do, do a differential bioinformatics uh, and isolated the bunch of peptides, or those are antigens, so roughly about 20 or 10, depending upon how many you get, very antigenic. And then you basically synthesize and conjugate with adjuvants, or you co-formulate with the adjuvant and inject back to the patient. So this is the cycle that is very much is happening in FDA and other companies are uh, pretty much counting on it. The two uh, uh, major uh, companies that are focusing on one is Boston Neon, Neon Science. They have a mixture of four peptides and they're looking for, uh, for uh, melanoma. And the, a consortium in Europe is called you know, GAPVAC. They have a mixture of 20 plus peptide and antigen. They're looking and, and to for uh, glioblastoma. And this consortium are focusing on developing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and identifying a, a peptide that are very uh, immunogenic in nature. So this is the future direction that I see uh, is going forward. So with that, I will stop for, uh, uh, um, for the next step. David, I'll, and we can discuss all the questions during the uh, panel discussion. Thank you, Ved. That was a great background, and I'm sure will serve as a real catalyst for lots of questions in our uh, panel discussion. Um, so next up is Alessandro Adelfio. Uh, Alessandro is head of data science at Neurotas, um, and he will provide a snapshot on Neurotas, um, as well as uh, uh, some background on the overall uh, use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and drug discovery. In contrast to the 200 plus companies that are in AI drug discovery now, Neurotas uniquely has five years of experience and can claim to have a marketed product that's AI derived. It's a consumer product actually called Peptide, which is a mix of peptides with anti-inflammatory properties that's positioned in the consumer market as an aid to exercise recovery. I'll pass it over to Alessandro to tell us more about the Neurotas approach and platform. Alessandro. Thanks, Arthur, and thanks, uh, Masbayo. So, hello, everybody. My name is Alessandro Delfio, and I'm head of data science at Neuritas. And, and today, I'm going to um, talk about the way at Neuritas we use our artificial intelligence to expand the opportunities in peptide drug discovery. So, starting with some context, this is our discovery pipeline, which should not be too dissimilar from most discovery pipelines. Our process starts with our, an, an unmet health or market need. Um, we use our in, silico, our in silico platform to predict a solution. The solution is manufactured and goes through the stages of uh, lab validation, optimization of preclinical and clinical trial to finally reach the market. What the green arrows mean here is that AI is affecting almost all the phases of our pipeline. In fact, we don't use AI only for target identification, target binding, or bioactivity, but also to predict uh, properties such as uh, cell penetrability, bioavailability, stability, or safety. So we really aim to guide all the stages of the process and reduce the discovery time to a fraction of the traditional one. Um, now, as you probably know, um, finding the best peptide for a given uh, application is a very nasty research problem. Um, the number of possible peptides in nature is uh, astronomical, and doing uh, exhaustive searches is not in, in this huge space. It, it's not. It's just not possible. So. AI allows us to explore the huge space based on discarded information available, and but this doesn't change the fact that uh, we still need data. So our predictive models of Neuritas are fueled by two main data flows. And on one side, we have the, dat the data that we have generated in our lab facilities over the last five to six years um, to validate or boost our predictors. That includes uh, thousands of in vitro bioassays in a vast range of areas, and as well as the in vitro and the in clinical data. On the other side, um, data from peptides, databases from all around the world, and from scientific literature has been found, checked for quality, and converted to a proprietary format. 
This knowledge base currently includes uh, millions of data points, uh, interconnecting peptides, and a vast array of therapeutic areas, bioassays, targets, cell types, and uh, specific properties. Of course, this effort of uh, building reliable data goes together with the effort of building uh, accurate models for uh, peptide activities and properties. And one of the main challenges we face when we want to build a predictor is finding the best way to encode uh, peptides. So here is a, a couple of uh, examples that show how the way we model a problem is very dependent on the data available. On the left, we wanted to model the gastric intestinal digestion of peptides. And in this case, we had uh, a good volume of uh, data produced in house through an in vitro model. And all the data was linear peptides coming from natural sources. So recurrent neural networks in uh, this uh, is the first method that comes to mind when uh, dealing with sequences. And they worked pretty, pretty well um, at separating the peptides that survive the different stages of digestion from the ones that do not survive. But we were also interested in using uh, state-of-the-art uh, deep learning models that have uh, been um, groundbreaking over the last two, three years in the field of um, natural language processing, especially. Um, uh, and use these models to compute meaningful embeddings uh, to be used as the inputs for the networks. So uh, as you can see, looking at the yellow and orange bars in the chart, we were able to get higher accuracy using these uh, embeddings. And uh, the more we sample the training set, uh, used, uh, the training set we used, um, the higher is the gain in accuracy compared to the recurrent networks alone. So this is showing uh, how encoding peptides in, in uh, smart ways can be crucial in uh, low data environments. On the right is a quite different situation where we have to deal with peptides that are not linear and heavily modified. In these cases where it's important to encode structural constraints, um, graphs were the most appropriate way to, to model peptides. In um, such a model, each node um, is a residue or a chemical group, and the edges are the bonds between those, uh, those entities. Each node can be associated to its physical chemical features, and these structures are then fed into a graph convolutional network um, that is trained to map peptides into the desired properties. So this worked pretty well, um, for example, for prediction of peptide half-life, um, where most of the data available is around peptides. They are heavily modified to optimize stability and often through cyclization. Um, now, before um, I move to the last two slides, where I will talk about a specific product that is currently in our pipeline, I would like to take a step back and, um, tell, and talk about uh, one of the main strands of our approach, that is what we generally call the predict, test, uh, refine loop. So given that we often work in low data environments, this approach is what allows us to boost our predictive models. And this is how it works. Um, so we train our predictive models um, using the two data flows that I described earlier. We predict a set of peptides using, um, usually uh, using the um, uh, library of natural peptides, our library of natural, of natural peptides. Then we test them in the lab and the results from the lab are fed back into the predictors for refinements. And the new set is predicted with a new version of the predictor. So, our efficient interface with the lab allows us to iterate to iterate this loop a few times, typically three or four. And at the end of the of those iterations, we generally get very potent candidates to move to move forward uh, our pipeline. So in last two, in the last two minutes, um, I want to tell you the story of one particular product that is currently in our discovery pipeline. For this one, we were predicting for peptides able to increase glucose uptake and then glucose for translocation. And after three iterations of the loop that I described in the previous slide, we identified a set of five peptides that were that we were confident uh, enough to move forward in our in our pipeline. One of them in particular showed consistent potency in the in vitro assays and significant uh, blood glucose uh, blood glucose reduction in in vivo and uh, reduction of fat uh, deposits in uh, liver tissue. 
Um, moreover, predictions of uh, um, its cell penetration properties were confirmed by confocal microscopy. microscopy. So um, we were interested in identifying the exact mechanism of action of this product, and in particular in finding um, if it's acting um, through a novel target. So using a target binding array in a human kidney cell, uh, we identified two primary um, targets for um, this neuritas peptide. One is uh, SLC35F2, a protein in the solid carrier family, a very novel target. Uh, currently, there is no assets targeting it in um, preclinical or clinical development, to our knowledge. And the uh, minimal scientific literature available suggests significant ro role in um, tumor genesis and fibrosis associated pathways. The other one is a uh, panexin one, which is the topic of the next talk. Um, and our peptide is showing very interesting properties. First, mm -hmm. and the current panexin one inhibitors are non selective, generally with activity across additional panexins. Um, and that was not observed um, with our peptide. Moreover, the IC50 um, values of, the, of our peptide is between uh, uh, five, na <coughs> 5 nanomolar and then 500 nanomolar, depending on the cell type, um, while panexin mediated. I'm really excited about this product. Um, we think it's a, 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 it has a big potential and we'll keep investigating over the next uh, few, few months. So I'll stop here and just will, I will just conclude thanking uh, you all for listening and uh, acknowledging a few of my co-workers who were involved in the building of the platform or whom I borrowed slides from. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. That was great. Uh, I think it'll set up uh, uh, some great discussion uh, and questions as well in our uh, panel coming up. And I just want to remind everybody, please, Feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A section and uh, we'll address those as we move into the moderated panel. So finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sylvia Penuela, who is Associate Professor at the University of Western Ontario. Um, she's going to pick up where Alessandro left off and from Alessandro's presentation you can see that Neurotas is very excited about identifying several peptides that demonstrate activity in the Panexin 1 pathway. Dr. Penuela's research is focused on the potential clinical impact of modulating activity in this pathway and, and she'll be highlighting some of the effects of blocking Panx1 and the potential applications to melanoma and inflammation. Sylvia? Yes, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to show you today some of the highlights of the, of the work that we do in my lab on the Panexin channels. And um, I'll start by saying that we uh, work in my lab, is a Panexin lab. We work in all the Panexins, not just Panexin 1, but we have many different projects that span uh, the gamut <coughs> of different um, aspects, for example, panexin-1 in fat, obesity and inflammation, panexin-2 in skin, panexin-3 in osteoarthritis, and uh, today I'll, I'll focus on our work in panexin-1 in melanoma that we have extended to glioblastoma. And it's, it's very interesting because these, these channels are not uh, so well known and they will have been discovered a couple of decades ago. But um, um, basically these this channels um, uh, form, uh, this kind of uh, channels form um, memory channels uh, that are different uh, characteristics, and they have been shown to be expressed, panexin 1, panexin 2, and panexin 3, in many different normal tissues, but at basal levels or maybe in early stages of development, they, those are the ones that you see here. Um, however, in cases of disease, you can see the list here in bold is what we have seen in cases of disease where um, panexin 1, for example, has been shown to be upregulated or dysregulated in some way uh, in a way that when it's blocked or when it's reduced or knocked out genetically, it has a, a positive outcome. So we got interested in, in looking at this from the point of view of, of health and disease. But uh, just to give you some little background on, on what Alessandro already described, the panexin-1 is a transmembrane protein that can oligomerize into a heptamer and form channels at the cell surface that are modified with glycosylation, which you see here. Normally, you would see panexin-1 at the cell surface when you overexpress it, and it has a multiple banding pattern that 
is uh, indicative of a different layers of glycosylation that they have. But we also see in some endogenous expression and in, in, in other tissues that panexin 1 can be intracellular. It can be in the endoplasmic reticulum and have different functions. Um, normally, we think about panexin 1 in terms of ATP release or making this large pore that can pass metabolites. Um, but it can also maybe uh, regulate calcium intracellular. So what we have done, uh, just to give you some highlights of some of the work we have done, is we, we have a panexin 1 null mice that we got from Genentech. And we have been characterizing that. And even though the, the mice is, is healthy, um, we have seen that when you challenge it, for example, in um, cases, for example, of a dorsal wound, um, the wound healing is significantly delayed, as you can see here in the red line. Um, it's significantly delayed in the inflammatory phase, in the proliferation phase, and in the um, final phase or fibrotic phase of the scar. And uh, so we started looking at what could cause this, and we published this before, showing that part of it is, is the role in inflammation, but also the differentiation of dermal fibroblasts and keratinocytes. But keep in mind, this is what happens when you remove panexin 1 from germline. So we think that panexin 1 might be there for a reason in terms of early development, but, um, but when you remove it from germline, then you have these kind of effects. It's not the same when you block it in the adult. Um, and for example, in wound healing, we see that normal skin of a mouse, in this case, an adult mice, have very low levels of panexin 1. So it's highly expressed in the, in the embryonic stage or early stages, and then is not needed later on, except for when there's a wound, for example, and then panexin 1 can be increased, maybe because of inflammation, and then it goes back to normal levels. But they, interestingly, interestingly, we saw that the wild type mice, for example, can heal perfectly fine. But the knockout mice can have these fibrotic wounds that heal in a, in a different way. So this is because we remove, again, the panexin 1 from germline, from the, from the, the genetic material. But um, what we have seen is that in the adult, uh, the skin of the adult basically has no panexin 1. And so we only see it coming up and really being increased in cases like melanoma. So when we look at melanoma, which is a very uh, deadly disease, the deadliest of all skin cancers, um, that progresses quickly from a um, melanocyte and, uh, and a nevus that gets transformed and it goes into metastatic disease very quickly. Uh, we know there's very limited treatment options, but good immunotherapies that are now in the market, but we would like to see we can improve uh, some of those therapies and it's increasing in, in incidence. But what we see, uh, like I said, from the, from the panexin point of view is that panexin is highly expressed in this tumor. So basically not there almost in the panexin one, uh, in the adult skin, but in the melanoma tumors, it's highly expressed. This is what you see here in green. This is MITF as a marker of, of melanoma cells. And we see it in primary, nodal, or distant metastasis. We see a high expression of panexin 1 all across. So the target is always there. <clears throat> so what we have started doing is um, looking at uh, human cell lines of melanoma that express all of these green is the antibody lighting up the, the, the panexin 1 in melanoma. And we see that, uh, and this is the Western blood, where you can see a lot of it, an endogenous expression is very, very high in the human cells. So the first thing we tried to do was to knock down panexin 1 with shRNA or short herpin RNA. We have also done uh, CRISPR knock knockouts. And we see a significant reduction, of course, of, of the panexin 1 when we do that. We see a slowdown of the growth when panexin 1 is not there slowdown of the migration, so less proliferation, less movement of the cells. And uh, that's nice, but we cannot delete genes from humans yet or from human tumors. And so we wanted to try to see if there's any pharmacological interventions that we could use. But unfortunately, the only things that are out there right now are um, some repurposed drugs for benzoyl carbonoxylone, for example, are widely used and highly uh, published for as, as blockers of panexin 1, but these are unspecific blockers. They have multiple targets. This one was used for gout and this one for ulcers. And so it's the best we can do with that right now, but we, we don't have very specific blockers. And um, we have started using some of these ones in very high doses. If we use 100 micromolar or even one millimolar to see some of the same effects that we see with the shRNA or the CRISPR knockout. But we do see a, a reduction in the growth, which is, is promising. And we also see a reduction in the migration when we, when we treat those cells, those melanoma cells with the blocker. So closing the channel, um, reducing the channel can have that effect. So that's, that's promising. We have also done some ex vivo, and now we're moving into in vivo um, uh, ex examples here with the mice. 
but uh, I'll just show you some of what we've done with our chick cam assays. It's a chicken embryo where we put the tumor on top and we allow the tumor to be vascularized and grow there. And we can add the blockers on top of the tumor, the prevented acetylcarbonoxone. And with that, we can reduce the size of the tumor significantly. The tumor is also less invasive and less likely to, to metastasize. But what is interesting is that it's not only on the side of the melanoma uh, or of the cancer cell, but we see that, for example, this is a collaboration we did with a group in Virginia, um, and they, uh, they showed that if you have leukemic cells that express panics in one channel, top cell surface, you could have, in, during apoptosis of these leukemic cells, the caspases that can come and cleave the tails of the panex in one and open the channel to release ATP. And this ATP acts as a FIMI signal to, to recruit monocytes or macrophages to the site. And so this is very interesting because it, it talks about the, the crosstalk between those cancer cells and the cells of the immune system. And we know that um, uh, what, what we try to do right now is just to see if even using this less than optimal prevenicid and carbonoxalone or some of the other blockers that um, are very unspecific drugs, we see that we can reduce the growth and the migration. This has been uh, published by us. So we have a cell intrinsic effect in the tumors. Um, but if we can also block the way they release interleukin beta or ATP and, and cross talk with some of those macrophages or, or tumor suppressor um, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment, we could potentially uh, increase the T cell infiltration that happens in those tumors and make uh, immunotherapies that target those T cells more effective. So of course, this is the overall goal at some point, and we, we are testing these hypotheses right now, see if we can do that. But um, we, we know that there's many other areas of interest for panexin one. Uh, recently, there's a couple of papers that um, have highlighted the role of panexin one in inflammation for injury and infection. And recently, um, a perspective uh, article that we wrote with some collaborators on the role of panexin one in COVID-19 pathology and treatment. We do think that it could be linked to the cytokine storm and the inflammation that happens in COVID-19. So there's many different areas that can um, be targeted, but we need specific blockers. And I'm excited to hear about the peptides from Neuritas, especially the peptide 260 and some of the other ones for targeting these panexin one channels. Uh, because we see that they can have multiple applications in disease treatments. And if they block um, also some of the solid carrier proteins, that's actually a good thing for cancer because then you can have reduced tumor genesis and, um, and migration and proliferation. So that's a very exciting uh, prospect for us. And uh, with that, I would like to thank my lab and the people in the lab that actually do the work. I just talk about it. And our funding agencies from Canada and the CIHR and NSERC. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia. That was great. Um, I'd like to uh, thank our three presenters and move to the panel discussion. Uh, again, encouraging everybody to submit your, your questions in the Q&A section. Um, we're adding two individuals to our panel discussion. I had mentioned both of them before, David Friedman and Karen Taylor. They've done significant research into the implications of AI and ML on the biopharma industry and the future of drug discovery. Um, and just by way of a brief summary, uh, in a supplement on AI and dig digital health in the December 2019 issue of Nature, David Friedman published on extensively researched article on Hunting for new drugs with AI. The pharmaceutical industry is in a drug discovery slump. How much can AI help? And then last year, as part of their Deloitte Insights series, Deloitte's Center for Health Solutions, which is the research arm of Deloitte's Life Sciences and Healthcare Practices, published an in-depth 40-page report on intelligent drug discovery. It's a great report and as research director, Karen Taylor was a key contributor and author of the report. The contents includes chapters on the rise of AI drug discovery disruptors and key considerations for biopharma's adoption of AI, which is obviously very consistent with the topic of our discussion today. 
So let me start with um, David and ask him to tell us a little bit about what he has learned in the research that he's done and his reaction to what he's heard here this morning. David? David? David's on mute. Uh, David, maybe you can come so, off mute. Uh, there we go. So I'm coming in, uh, I'd rather come in through the phone if I can. I'm also connected on the phone. Uh, are you able to um, get my voice up from talking on the phone? We hear you yeah. fine. All right. Well, let's try. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to hear me. Just look panicked uh, if I'm being disrupted. My, I apologize. Uh, my internet connection has just suddenly uh, become very unstable. But let me plow ahead. Um, so first of all, let me ask, are you able to hear me OK so far? Yes. Good. Um, well, so uh, I, uh, I uh, I won't go into great detail on some of the uh, statistics behind why the drug industry is so phenomenally interested and driven to try to make AI work. Uh, l let me just say that the ability of the um, pharmaceutical industry to come up with new successful drugs uh, has pretty much plummeted uh, over the past uh, decade or so. And it's largely because of a reason that hangs over all of science, which is uh, we've solved all the easy problems. And now what's left are the tougher ones. And the pharmaceutical industry is really suffering from that problem. Uh, and, and so the problems that are in front of it are vast, require uh, a tremendous amount of analysis of vast amounts of data. And uh, that's something that in theory, uh, machine learning and deep learning can really help with. So let me start by mentioning a couple of the uh, fundamental advantages of taking that approach. Uh, one is it allows for a uh, brute force approach. You can simply evaluate uh, far more data uh, in less time. Uh, and that's obviously a big advantage. Uh, the, the second one's a little more nuanced, uh, which is artificial intelligence isn't limited to evaluating data based on anything we actually understand about uh, biology. Uh, because AI works strictly in a statistical way, uh, it's able to come up with its own rules for evaluating what might be promising and what is less so. And of course, in pharmaceuticals, it's just as important to eliminate uh, uh, candidates that are less likely to succeed because that's such a, a tremendous waste of time and money and really plagues the industry. So uh, AI can find new ways of evaluating these uh, situations to figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, the, the downside to that is because the techniques that AI is using to do these evaluations are not supported by underlying theory or experience in many cases, it's not clear that these are actually valid. It's discovering something, but scientists often don't understand what. And that makes validation even more important uh, than it already is uh, in pharmaceuticals. And so the bottom line there is uh, AI is turning up a lot of interesting new candidates, but no one is confident that these candidates will actually pan out. And we probably won't know uh, for probably at least six years and maybe 10, whether a lot of these techniques are really improving the situation. Um, and let me mention something else, taking a step back, which is uh, uh, AI is certainly an active area of investigation in drug discovery, but it's also an incredibly active area in clinical care. And that turns out to be very relevant for drug discovery because uh, it, in helping with diagnosis and choosing treatments and monitoring patients, the clinical side of using AI, and AI is deeply involved in all of these areas right now, um, uh, that allows AI to uh, better predict 
which drugs are more likely to work safely with which patients. And when you can do that, it really lowers the bar on drug discovery. So for example, imagine you had a drug that goes into trials today and it only helped 15% of the people uh, that it tr was used on, but an even larger percentage were harmed in some way by the drug or perhaps just wasted a lot of precious time and money uh, trying out a drug that didn't work on the other 85%. On the other hand, if you can predict which 15% are likely to be the ones that will be helped, well, then you have an enormous hit. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. And then you can whittle away at the problem by finding drugs that work on 5 or 10% of the population. So AI can actually help with drug development uh, by, as I say, lowering the bar on the percentage of patients you need to be able to help if you can say what those percentages are. Uh, another area where AI is playing a role is in biologics development and production. Uh, a lot of the process of biosynthesizing complex organic molecules has already been automated. Now uh, scientists are starting to stick AI on top of that process to really speed it up by a factor of up to 100. So that could be uh, a huge improvement as well. Uh, in drug discovery, uh, when it comes to finding targets, uh, we, we've seen a lot of activity there. Uh, one, let me mention one company, uh, Berg. Uh, they're doing something really interesting to find targets. Uh, they're actually adding AI uh, to the laboratory processes uh, on um, tissues taken from patients and just subjecting them to a vast range of conditions for patients who do have a disease or who don't. And then the AI is turned loose on that data to look for patterns in uh, which sorts of things do we observe in the tissue uh, that may be present in patients with a disease versus patients who don't have a disease and then further to look at which proteins seem to be implicated in, in the differences between the two. And if you can find those proteins, now you have targets. And that's critical. Uh, the industry, of course, is always short on protein targets. Um, then you have to design drugs to bind to the target. And that is really difficult as well. Uh, and, and let me mention one company, Accenture, uh, which uh, seems to be able to, although this really has to be validated, uh, cut the process uh, from in terms of how long it takes to find a drug that actually works on a protein target uh, from about five years to one year. Uh, and the result is generating a list of potential candidates, uh, candidate drugs that is as little as a fifth as long. And the fewer candidates you have, the less testing you have to do. So that's super valuable as well. Uh, another key area is predicting side effects. Uh, that's an enormous problem, of course, uh, in, in drugs. And AI uh, so far is doing a lot of promising things and trying to look at candidates and predicting which ones will have a higher likelihood of uh, side effects. Uh, one example is uh, it, there's always, there's often difficult with the liver enzymes that prevent the buildup of a drug in, in blood. That's a very common way that drugs fail. It's difficult to do that ahead of trials, and it's often in phase three trials where you discover that uh, the drug actually suppresses the liver enzymes that do prevent that buildup. That's a showstopper for a lot of drugs, um, but already, We've seen uh, in uh, AI has been able to offer as much as a six-fold improvement uh, in uh, predicting which drugs are likely to run into that problem so they can be washed out earlier, which is invaluable, of course. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to take years for validating some of these processes. One way to sidestep that is to use drugs, to look at drugs that are already approved. There's been some advances there with AI, a company called Cyclica working with uh, Merck and Bayer um, have already 
uh, looked at a drug that was has been approved for depression. It seems to help with systemic scleroderma. Uh, also, a drug um, uh, that was approved for HIV seems to work against uh, the Ebola virus. Uh, actually, looking at my notes, I, I may have reversed those two. Uh, the Ebola virus, I believe, was approved for depression uh, and the scleroderma for uh, HIV. So, um, anyway. I, I talked to a lot of executives at both AI companies and at pharmaceutical companies to get a sense of how much of this is considered potential hype and how much is real. Um, look, there's no question there's a certain amount of hype. Everyone thinks the promise is absolutely real, but definitely needs to be validated in a big way. Uh, uh, people at the pharmaceutical companies are concerned this won't pan out. Um, but so far, so good is probably the best way to look at it. Uh, when I did my research, I found 22 different partnerships between pharma companies and AI drug discovery companies, uh, and I'm sure that number is, is bigger today. Uh, it, it, we know at least um, uh, two companies are building massive, two pharmaceutical companies are building large in-house AI units I suspect, again, the number is much larger. Um, uh, the, I think the question will be how many of these drugs, either uncovered or in some way validated by AI primarily, will make it all the way through to FDA approval. Until we see uh, several of those go through, I think the question marks will hang over the industry. Uh, but if there's uh, a possibility of streamlining, streamlining the approval process that the FDA uses, perhaps to take into account the way AI looks at candidates, it may be possible to actually shorten the process. Because as we mentioned, uh, AI uses different techniques. And if we can get more faith in those, then the FDA may shorten the requirement uh, for actually approving a drug and may, for example, allow passing over animal models and going straight to human testing because AI may be able to provide the data that animal testing normally provides. Uh, Everybody is concerned David, about- I'm gonna, uh, David, yeah. I'm gonna stop you there because I think we're, we're starting to move into an area that um, gets to some of the elephants on the table. I appreciate you setting Good. that up. I'd like to give- Karen, a uh, chance to share some of her information and the work that she's done. She's got a great chart in one of her articles on the history and progression of drug discovery paradigms. And, and uh, it, it starts with uh, 1952 and with X-ray diffraction and imaging DNA crystals. But um, I think one of the big questions that everybody's asking is whether or not we're looking at a new tool in the toolbox or we're really changing the paradigm, which is somewhat of what uh, I think David was trying to set up in, in the discussions that he's had. So Karen, what are your thoughts and what have you learned? I, you're on mute, Karen. I'm on mute. <laughs> there you yes, go. So, so, sorry, thank you very much. Um, I've, I've just got four slides and, I'm, and they're really just there to, to help explain what we do. I'm not a scientist. I did biochemistry at university, but that's about as far as my claim goes. I, I'm a researcher and I sort of do a helicopter view of some of the challenges facing healthcare and life sciences. And I've used this slide just to uh, illustrate that one of the big challenges, as already mentioned by David, is that the average cost of R&D process um, is increasing and the, the, the um, sales that you can expect to achieve, the forecast sales, is reducing. Um, and in fact, we, we've studied this over 10 years in a report called Measuring the Return from Pharma Innovation. And the cost calculated in, and that should say 2019, was 1.8981 billion pounds for, to bring one um, drug to market. And the expected forecast peak sales um, per asset was 376 million, a 50% reduction from where we were in 2010. And that means the return on investment has declined steadily since 2010, and it's way below the return on capital. Uh, and, and that's really looking at late stage assets. So 
the challenge for pharma is to try and reduce those costs and increase the sales. And to do that, a lot of what David said is relevant. Around, around a third of the costs are in the, the um, drug discovery process and, and also um, a uh, about five to six years of the timeline of an average cost of uh, time of 10 to 12 years. Um, and a large amount of hit and miss and, and very few drugs actually making it all the way from discovery through to um, market. So improving drug discovery is really important. So we've done a series of reports on AI across the pharma value chain um, and um, drug discovery was our first deeper dive, we've done clinical trials, we've done supply chain, and we're currently doing um, launch and value. But let's talk about drug discovery and that search for um, a strong and secure binding. Intelligent drug discovery, why AI, why now? Well, um, it can reduce the timeline for drug discovery, it can increase the accuracy, and it can prove, improve the diversity, all points that David has dealt with. Um, but one of the things that I, I wanted to say, and you've mentioned as well, Arthur, is the increasing number of AI for drug discovery companies. In our report, we have case studies on, on six of them um, and where they had evidence of improved outcomes and, and progress in finding candidates. Um, David's mentioned a couple of them already. And we had 170 back at this time last year. There are now over 200. In developing that timeline you mentioned, we worked with Deep Knowledge Analytics, who produces a quarterly report on the AI for drug discovery market, um, and um, also produces incredible amounts of insights into how this, this process and, and developments in this area are growing. Um, and so um, I would like to thank that their, them for their insights that helped us. But the five considerations that we identify by farm as adoption of AI, and it isn't about the technology, it is about a change management process for these companies. It's about having access to data. We you talked about, uh, several people have talked about the data that's important to be able to apply the AI out to develop and apply the AI to. Um, and there are lots of different data sources, um, but improving the reliability and the robustness of that is absolutely critical and that's where a lot of collaborations and consortia and partnerships come in. The disruptive potential of tech giants to help um, companies understand the value of data and how to use data. Increasing diversification of the drug pipeline is one of the benefits of being able to use AI. It can allow companies to diversify their pipeline. Critical issue is the talent, skills and talent within pharma companies to be able to understand the AI for drug discovery landscape. And then really important, um, if you're going to be able to prove this, if, if you're going to be able to get some sense from signals from all this noise that's out there, establishing new performance metrics. Um, one of the co companies in Silico that you mentioned has published uh, over 120 peer review papers. And that's a really important marker of how really valid some of these drug discovery companies are. But we identify something like 50 partnerships that are in the public domain between Big Pharma and AI for drug discovery companies in trying to move this needle in and improve the cost, effect, cost effectiveness of drug discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, I want to follow up on, on your comments and, and some of the findings, Karen, because at the end of your report, um, your team predicted that by 2030, drug discovery processes are likely to be mostly outsourced to external AI companies, where research will be done in silico and in collaboration with academia, which sort of sets up these two dynamics of both academia and um, the AI companies as being the real drivers for future discovery. Do you still feel we're headed in that direction? And if so, what do you think are the implications for the industry? Are we gonna see a, an 800 pound gorilla like Google as the lead outsource company or will they be highly specialized? And where does academia play in that sandbox? So it's a really good question. I think I think what we've seen over the last um, nine months with in with the sort of search and race for a, a treatment and a vaccine for, for COVID um, is increasing partnerships and collaborations, which bring in 
the AI for drug discovery companies, it brings in academia, but it's also being done um, in partnership with the, the big pharma companies as well. Um, and in some cases, supported by some of the big tech companies. So it's much more, I, I think what we've seen there is, is perhaps a new model of more partnerships and collaborations, but nevertheless, the expertise in the use of AI um, in this space is with these AI for drug discovery companies. And given that the skills that you need in AI are much sought after big, by big tech, by um, other industries, um, actually focusing the skills on this part of the value chain doesn't, does seem to make a lot of sense. Um, the other side of it, of course, is the regulators. And the regulators themselves have predicted that they expect to see about 50% of um, drugs that are entering phase one trials coming from um, some of the, the more de novo in, um, in, in silica type trial approaches. I haven't got a date for that, they didn't put a date on it, but they did say 50%. So, so I, I think it's a sort of convoluted answer, but the answer is more collaborations and partnerships that we're seeing today, predicted to continue into the future. It's an interesting uh, uh, area to look at from a future perspective. I'm, I'm curious, to, we have a really cross-disciplinary uh, and cross-functional panel here, and we did that on purpose, actually, because there are so many aspects that we wanted to try to cover, put us into a bit of a time bind, but um, any thoughts from our panelists on uh, the prediction that Karen talked about? Sylvia, you're on mute, there you go. Yeah, I think it's it's very exciting, and actually this, this makes sense to us from an academia point of view, because we each have our, our niche where we're working on, but when AI can predict um, what is the next drug, what is the next target, and then find a person in a, is a small company or, a, or an industry or have the academia come in on board and we can help you validate that target. We can help you understand that target better than the, the company trying to start from scratch and doing it all over again, right? So I think it's a real value in those collaborations. And uh, Ved, from, from your perspective, I think um, obviously uh, if you were a CSO of a mid-sized biotech or a discovery scientist going into work tomorrow, based on what we've talked about here and, and some of these sort of future thoughts that uh, we're discussing, how would you think about uh, the information that you learned today? Would you do anything differently? Would you take that knowledge that you have of peptides and novel delivery technologies and, and uh, artificial intelligence machine learning and, and apply that in a different way to your daily goals and objectives? Yeah, it's, it's a loaded question. And uh, an artificial intelligence approach has a, a multi-dimensional application. Uh, but it, it, if I would say that uh, focus on two key items that is drug discovery, companies are struggling with it, uh, specifically peptide-based. Uh, and, and one is that translation from animal data to the human data. This is a major, a major challenge that we see it in peptide-based. Sometimes animal data looks great, but the, uh, the human data does not translate exactly. And Sanofi has demonstrated very lately and others have demonstrated that. To do that, we have a 70 plus peptide that's already been approved in the market, it's already there. Take those animal data that is out there and build a machine learning and come up with the inter artificial intelligence approach that can define some of those predictive tools and build the predictive tool. If you have this particular data in animal, this is going to translate, just like we do a dose prediction from animal data to the human dose, right? The uh, same kind of algorithm needs to be done. So, so this is one question that, that solves a lot of a, 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 um, problems that, uh, and it will shorten the timeline that we talked about here rather than we uh, 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 do. That is the one thing. Second thing is that, um, Design aspects of the peptide to build uh, a, improve the bioavailability or stability and all these things. Those are great because this is not a very good predictive tool that are out there. Whether you can use AI predictive tool that will be generally applicable there. 
that will solve the design process and that will reduce your five year time frame into the one or two year time frame in order to develop from target to all the clinical candidates. So I look at the whole discovery panel in two angles from this target to the clinical candidate, from clinical candidate to the phase two B, which is proof of concept. And those are the two areas is very challenging. So if, if you focus one step at a time, I think that's the way we can leverage the AI and also validate the AI, which is the, one of the major challenges that we really need to, the industry is facing it. We are looking, we are handling the AI from multiple angles, but really not focusing on one or two areas to validate that. That's the way I would see it. And again, it's peptide perspective, not the small molecule or the perspective, process perspective. Right. Okay, based on discovery perspective. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think we could keep going here for another hour. We specifically tried to limit uh, this to roughly a 60 minute time frame because of the fact that we know we, we uh, start to lose people after, after that amount of time. But this is a really interesting discussion, a lot of dimensions to it. I want to thank all of our panelists for the contributions. I, I'm sorry we couldn't get uh, into more details with each one of the panelists because I think each one of them has something more to offer and more to say. But um, nevertheless, your contributions were terrific and we appreciate it. We don't have any open questions that are in the Q&A section, but um, if people want to reach out individually to any of our panelists, I'm sure they'd be uh, willing to be interactive with you and I'm sure that Karen and David would be willing to share their uh, articles with you if if you are interested in that as well. But uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to continue this discussion in sort of a, a version two at some point. And um, we thank everybody for joining and uh, hopefully uh, this has been uh, uh, a contribution to your knowledge base in the area of artificial intelligence, machine learning and, and the peptide arena. Thanks very much. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know.